Are you ready to start a class? Father, we just come before you in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, we just humble ourselves before you. Lord, we come as nothing before you. We come to the fullness of you. And Lord God, as we hear the word of God, we ask you to write this word in us. It's not, like, it's not enough just to hear it. But Lord, let the word abide in us. Let's come to be a people that abide by the word of God and nothing else. Not feelings, not emotions, not what we're going through or anything else. But a people whose life is totally, oh God, wrapped around and grasping the word of God. Well, make your word today grand and glorious. Make it holy. Purify in our hearts, O oh God. Drive out everything that's not like you. Fill us with your character and your nature, your likeness. Lord, we see the promise of becoming partakers, partners in your divine nature. Lord, it's too much for us to even grasp. A partner, a sharer in your, your nature. But Lord, that's what you're saying. Make this true in our own lives. We ask you, we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Jesus. Can everybody say amen? Amen. Well, for the most part, we're going to start off in the New Testament where we were in the last meeting. This will be take number 13 in taking the land, possessing the land, which God has given to us. I think that one of the most important things you're going to learn as we continue to go through the book of Joshua, I know there are some that would dare say that they think that Ephesians is the most important book in the Bible. I don't know how you can ever call any book more important than the others. I think you're all good. I love the book of Hebrews because it fulfills the prophecy of Zechariah the sixth chapter when Jesus will be reigning and ruling as high priest. But the book of Ephesians, yes, it is an important book. Well, Joshua reminds me of the book of Ephesians. And the reason it reminds me of that book is because in the book of Ephesians, we learn about a lot of things in the spirit that we don't find in any other book. Paul will hint about some of the things, mostly in most of the book that he writes, uh, and you can see the fulfillment of everything he hints about usually fulfilled in the book of Ephesians. For example... The book of Ephesians, he says to us very clearly, you might call it a book of a foundation, one of the standards or pillars of the word of God. He says in that book, the second chapter, our lives must be built upon the prophets. He points out in that one statement, the prophets, not the modern day prophets, but the prophets of the Old Testament. He wasn't talking about those that prophesied. He was talking about the prophets of the Old Testament. Then he pointed out also the apostles. Of course, we know they were the apostles of the New Testament. And then he said, of course, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. He talks about something spiritual. Something that you might say is not something we can just reach out and just touch and grasp and just figure out so easily. Then, also in that book, he talks about what happened when the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross. Tells us how he was raised up to this place, so exalted above all gods so high and lifted up. And then he does something profound. He begins by telling us how that when we were dead in our sins, Christ also reached down and raised us up with him. It's a place to walk in the Spirit, to live in the Spirit. Well, that's what the book of Joshua is about. Here is a people who are raised up by God. Their parents had been destroyed. It was to their parents that God had given the promises that they would possess the land. And before God gave the promise to their parents, he gave it first to Abraham. He was the first. He said, I'm going to give you this land. And gave him the borders and the boundary of this special possession that God would give to him. And God even said to him, you won't see it fulfilled in your lifetime, but I will do it. And God prophesied to Abraham and said to him, Your descendants will go into captivity for 400 years. And he said in the fourth generation, and God began to explain to us then that a generation is 100 years. He said, in the the fourth generation, they'll come back and they'll possess this land. And so we begin to see God begin to bring about a fulfillment of his word after 400 years. He raised these people up, brought them out of Egypt, out of the bondage of Pharaoh. And he began to train them for warfare. Begin to train them to eat manna in the wilderness. And each one had to go out for themselves daily and to scoop and bend down 
and get the allotted amount. The Bible described it, said it was like Calenda seed, seed pointing to the word of God. Saying that your life must not be on other things that satisfy the flesh, but a life that begins to cut away from the things that satisfy, satisfy the flesh, and you begin just to eat just the word of God. And these people, they came out in martial array. They were dressed for war. And it amazes me that when God had them to come out of this bondage of captivity, dressed like soldiers, that they never seemed to understand that God had brought them out for war, for fighting, to take possession of what he had already given to them. Most of them came out with the attitude that God was to wait on them. And so, therefore, because they had begun to presume on God, they set themselves almost from the very beginning on a path of destruction. But yet in this book of Joshua, we begin to learn about a people who begin to take God at his word. And it's sad because they took God at his word, not so much because of a great love for him, but because they had learned in their history what had happened to their relatives. And they began to learn about how God's judgment would come on anybody that would break his commandment or would not do what he commanded them to do. No matter what it looked like, no matter what the circumstances were, if God said to do something, they had learned that God meant it. And that if they didn't do it, then God would remove them and bring in more people to take their place. And therefore, they would lose all the rewards and all the promises of God that God had given to them would be made void and nullified. And so these people began to move very enthusiastically to do what God told them to do. They began also to learn in this book of Joshua that as they began to move, if any sin came in the camp, it would again halt the strength of God and the compassion of God and the love of God and would cause them to begin to lose a whole camp of them, the war that they were all fighting in. We saw this happen at I, didn't we? Well, God did begin to fulfill his word. He told them to go in and take the land. We studied very much the 14th chapter of Numbers and begin to see when they went and spied the land out. Yes, it was there just like God told them. Yes, it did flow with milk and honey, which means the word milk and honey means all your needs are absolutely met that you'll never have a want for anything. They go into the land and they see all the fruit. God had prophesied about, I'm going to bring you to a place, vineyards, never planted. I'm going to have it already there for you. And so they go in and they spend 40 days in that land, spying it out. They saw for themselves the riches of that land. But they also saw something else. They saw that was an enemy to drive out the land. And instead of looking at the greatness of God, they made the same mistake that many of us make. Some of us look at ourselves. Some of us look at our weaknesses. You'll never overcome looking at your weaknesses. You'll never overcome looking at yourself. But they look at the giants. I don't care how many times you fail God, how many times you've fallen. Don't look at yourself. Begin to look at him. Look at unto Jesus, he said. They didn't look unto Jesus. They didn't look unto God. They kept looking at the strength of the enemy. They looked at the size of the enemy, and they looked at the multitude of the enemy to be driven out of the land. It's like a person that's trying to lose weight. You begin to try to lose weight, you begin to try to slowly discipline yourself, then all of a sudden you just look at how much you got to lose, and it's like it overwhelms you. But that's what happened to them. They looked at the giants. And we're talking about a massive being, just one of them. The historians tell us very clearly they weighed from 500 to 800 pounds of physical muscle wasn't any fat. You learn when you study these giants, they've been trained for war all their lives. And that's where the demon powers are. This is a war we're involved in. And many of us would rather do like so many do. We allow ourselves to be totally possessed by religion, what makes us feel good, rather than to really come up and strip ourselves to fight. But God began to tell them about fighting. And so when we come to the New Testament, one of the apostles that amazed me the most is the Apostle Paul. Because, see, Paul did not live his life with the rest of the apostles of the Lord Jesus. He didn't see Jesus like they did for three and a half years. Paul only saw him in a revelation. The Lord appeared to him. But for some reason, Paul had a greater revelation than all the other apostles combined. 
So much so he wrote over two thirds of the New Testament. And yet he saw Jesus in a revelation. I believe he saw him again also when he was raised from the dead. Right? They had stoned him. But we know that he did not see Jesus and touch Jesus and live with Jesus and eat with Jesus. He be fed by Jesus, physical food, like the rest of them did. But yet this man learned to walk by the Spirit, walk by faith. And that's what the book of Joshua is all about. Now, in the last meeting, you know that we left that book and we began to go into the New Testament. And if you remember, we began to look at what Paul told us to do in order to take possession of the land. And for the sake of this course, and that we don't forget what we're talking about, I want to remind you again about that word land. There are many words in the Bible, in the Hebrew, for the word land, and we're spending most of this uh, teaching, this six weeks, in the Old Testament. And the reason we're using the Old Testament is because the Old Testament is for us today as much as the New Testament is for us today. We know this because of what the Lord has said to us in the New Testament, pointing us back to the Old Testament. Dr. Luke writes to us in the book of, of Acts, for example, the third chapter from verses 17 to 26. Dr. Luke says to us very clearly that every prophet, beginning with the prophet Samuel, and every prophet in succession was writing to us concerning these last days. And so Dr. Luke told us by revelation that the purpose of the Old Testament prophets was for those of us that would live in the last days. Paul gives us revelation in the 15th chapter of Romans, in the 4th verse, and he says to us, whatever was written in earlier times, again, Paul points us back to the Old Testament, he says it was written for our instruction, the instruction for those of us that's living under the times of the New Testament. We find the very same words also by, by Brother Paul. He writes to us in 1 Corinthians, the ninth chapter, and he says, I will be found among those who have preached to others and then they are passed away. And then to make sure that we understood what he was saying to us, he gives us the 10th chapter of 1 Corinthians. And from verses 1 to verses 11, he points us back and tells us all the things that happened. And Paul goes way, way beyond what Dr. Luke did. He points us all the way back into the time of Moses. Luke quoted some of Moses in Acts 3. Well, Paul goes way beyond that. It goes all the way back to times of Abraham and tells us very clearly about all the things that have happened to the people of God and says to us that these things happen for our instruction. So much so, he said it twice. We go on and on and on about different ones that told us about the Old Testament. Brother Peter said to us in 1 Peter, the first chapter, in verses 1 through 9, he says that the prophets were wondering who were they writing all these things to? He said, it was finally revealed to them. They weren't serving themselves. He said, but you people, for the gospel preached to you through the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. And so we learn from reading what the New Testament writers told us. The Old Testament is as important to us today as the New Testament. Jesus quote from the Old Testament. He says, in the volume of the book, it is written of me. I've come to do thy will, O God. Which means it's all about Jesus from Genesis to Revelation. And Jesus quotes something out of David's writings. David is caught in the Spirit and he just starts speaking about the Spirit. He says, Lo, I come in the Bible, the book is written of me. Now we learn he was speaking in the first person. The Spirit of Jesus had come on him when he wrote those words. And so we're using the Old Testament, a lot of it. Because what's said to us is first natural, then spiritual. And so we're reading about them having to fight a natural war. And now we're learning that when Paul writes about our warfare, it's a spiritual war. And just like it happened to those in the Old Testament who did not want to fight in a war and they were destroyed, God is revealing to us it's the same way it is under the New Testament. If you're not willing to fight, we'll be destroyed. Paul uses war terms. He says to Timothy, in the book of Timothy, you suffer hardship with me. Suffer hardship with me. And he speaks as a military man. He says, as a good soldier. 
writing again about being a soldier. He says, no soldier that's enlisted, that's involved in active service, active service, entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life. Paul writes these words to his son in the gospel, young Timothy, as a military general. He writes again in 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, 2 Corinthians 10, excuse me, and talks about the weapons of our warfare. He talks about our warfare, pointing again that in the New Testament, under this thing called salvation, it's war, and we're enlisted for war. Again, he writes about a warfare. He says, our weapons are spiritual. He said, our weapons are mighty through God. To the putting down of strongholds. He tells us to fight this war with the weapons of God. Through God, he says. He talks about the way we fight through God, casting down imaginations. And every high thing that would exalt itself against knowledge of God. But that's not the way we would normally fight a war. See, it's amazing, just like they didn't want to fight it physically. We're trying to fight the war physically in our own strength. God has said, no, no time for that. You fight it now by the Spirit. Cast down imagination. You learn to take every thought captive. <laughs> then again, Paul writes, again, in the New Testament, about a warfare. He writes in Ephesians 6 and talks about what we've done all we're going to do, stand. He talks about putting on some armor. We learned that before about the armor of God is for aggressive purposes on the offense, and also for defensive purposes. He talks about for defensive purposes, he talks about the shield of faith, wherewith we shall be able to extinguish or quench all the fiery darts of the enemy. He talks about that. He talks about an offensive weapon. He talks about the sword of the spirit. If you take the sword of the spirit, he talks about more protective headgear. He talk, calls it a helmet of salvation. About a warfare. So we've learned much about a warfare all through the New Testament, even though most of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ today attempts to close their eyes. I've heard them say, I don't see a warfare. When we begin to talk about this part of the gospel, they say that we're cultic, we're off on the deep end, we've gone to the extremes, they say everything, just so they can justify themselves by not having to fight. Others say, I don't want to know about it. Because therefore they think when they stand before God, they'll say, well, see, God, I should come to heaven because, you see, I didn't know about it. No. He's given us his word. He also said in his word, my people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. And I, don't know, I could use that quotation in two places. We know from Hosea and also Isaiah. Let's use it from Isaiah. My people destroy from lack of knowledge. It's in the fifth chapter. It's in that chapter he said that the people of God, who claimed they were people of God, hell had to enlarge its throat to receive so many that came at one time from the church thinking they were people of God. Stop and think about that. Well, let's go back and remember what we're talking about. We're talking about possessing the land. Jesus said to us, it's finished. The war is over. He said to us very clearly, he rendered him powerless who had the power. He told us, he's given us his victory. He said, he's saying to us, I've given you the land. You now go in and take that which I've given to you. Jesus makes another statement. He says the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, but the violent will take it by force. Let us know that there's a time when you become almost violent in going after the things of God, driving off the enemy from what is rightfully ours because it was given to us from by a decree of the king, God. But a lot of us, when we came to Christ, we didn't know anything about a suffering path, a path of warfare. We were told that it was easy as one, two, three, easy as ABC. Go to church, pay your tithes, sing your songs, read your Bible, 
you got it made. We're taught very much about stirring up ourselves. We're taught very much about the times that we find ourselves in depression and pit, put on the garment of praise. We're taught very much about praise binding the powers of hell. We weren't taught very much about speaking the word of God, putting the word of God in our mouths. So to condemn every tongue that comes against you, mean, meaning with the word of God. We weren't taught very much about a warfare at all. And so we began to allow ourselves to be lulled to sleep, just like the Pharisees were. Their foundation was, we know the Bible more than any other religion. And they did. So much so, even more than we know it today. And they rejected Jesus. They never knew about the word being living. It was just all a list of rules. And so today, before he comes, the Lord is preparing the people to come to a place of understanding. And so we begin to read about taking a land. And the word land we're talking about for the sake of this Bible class is the word 7130. It's, it's pronounced Carib. It means inward parts, bosom, heart, inside feelings it means the body it means all these things that we're concerned with in our walk with God and so we're using the word land to apply to our hearts we've also learned it means the intros the deepest innermost feelings and many times they would give sacrifices and God would talk about the fact and the intros God was saying I want everything about you possessed I want everything about you in my will. I want everything about you walking in my victory. In an attitude of alertness, war, always ready to go on the offensive, no matter what the time, no matter what the circumstances. Soldiers in active service. Most of us have begun to learn about a war, and we prefer to allow ourselves to fight strongly when the powers of hell are coming against us. And once we've got maybe some victory, it's almost like we say, well, let's rest a while and just take it easy. What we're doing is literally giving the enemy permission to come back after, at us. Because we've learned now, this is the fifth week, we only have one more week of this. So we're going to have a lot of ground to cover. We've learned that when you go on the war against the enemy, you stay on the war against him. You keep him running. You never take a rest until all the land has been conquered. Can you say amen to that? Amen. So, let's go back where we left off. If you remember, we began to see some instructions. In the New Testament, we looked at our inheritance. We looked at Ephesians 1. We looked again. We went from verses 3 to 11. We also look at verses 18 to 23. We saw that Joshua, just like we were given our inheritance, Joshua was told about his inheritance, and we learned that Joshua had to fight to gain what was stated and promised to him as his inheritance. We saw in 1 Timothy 6, 12, last time we met together, about this fight was called fighting the good fight of faith. And everything about this warfare from the powers of hell is to cause us to lose faith in God and to transfer our faith to Satan and his greatness. It's impossible for a human being, as we said before, to not serve somebody. It's also impossible for a human being not to have faith. God has given to every man a measure of faith. How do you use it? In the power of the enemy? You put your faith in your own self? Or do you put your faith where it belongs? In God. All faith that's only placed in God and God alone is perverted faith. We saw very clearly in Hebrews 11 chapter about a war. But fighting and after receiving and believing the promises it's God manifests himself. Seeing this God that's faithful, that promise. You know it's a fight to keep seeing God that's faithful, that promise? 
We saw very clearly in 2 Corinthians, the first chapter, that God is faithful to all his promises to those who place their faith in Christ Jesus. We saw that very clearly. We also saw very clearly in 2 Peter, the first chapter, seeing it. And only until we see it, we are kept outside of that place that Jesus died for us to have. And that place, Jeremiah says, is the throne of God. Paul said to us, it was raised up and seated with Christ in heavenly places. Until you see it, you're kept from taking that place. As we said to us in Peter, seeing that God has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises that by them you might become partakers or sharers of the divine nature. I hope that hits you one day that we are living partners in God's nature. Seeing that God has granted us everything, everything that pertains to life and godliness. We're talking about the weapons of our warfare. Seeing it. Faith. Seeing that God is faithful, weapons of our warfare, seeing it. Paul said, I pray that the eyes of your heart will become enlightened, seeing it. We saw this. And so we left off at Ephesians 6. Let's go back to it. We left off at Ephesians 6, excuse me, excuse me, Hebrews 6, talking about it's through faith and patience. I can tell you now, if you ever come to a place of frustration or weariness or you're tired of waiting on God, you're making that spirit called patience void in your life. A person that is truly walking in faith and patience comes to a place where it's not important to him anymore how long it takes for God to move. He's not putting God in a box trying to become God telling God when to move when to move and when to do it. He simply says, I've come to a place, I know you're faithful to your promises. I know you're going to do it. Look what he says in Ephesians 6 again. Paul writes again by revelation, and he says, that you may not be sluggish. That means sluggish in warfare. Lazy in warfare. Slowful in warfare. Negligent in warfare. But Paul continues to write, he said, but imitators of those who through faith and, what's that word? Patience. What happens to those who through faith and patience, he says they inherit. That's a key word, inherit. See, he said to them, I've given you the land. Go up and take the land. He spoke to them. Go up and take the land. Do you remember where we are? No. Hebrews 6, 12. That you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those. In other words, everybody that's, that's part of the remnant, they all look just alike. They're all mimicking everything God said to do. They're all imitating one another. I'm not talking about imitating for failure. I'm talking about what Paul is talking about, imitating Jesus, who through faith and patience, they inherit the promises. Are those words also in your Bible? Say with me, God is faithful. God is faithful. In 2 Corinthians, the sixth chapter, the other side of this coin, your faith also prevent you from trusting God. Well, I'll tell you what, we'll wait and go to Second Corinthians later because I'll use it in another aspect when we look at it then. Let's just go right to where we want to begin today. Let's go to Isaiah 53rd chapter. And this is the greatest weapon of our warfare than any of them accepting and believing what Jesus 
has already done. What Jesus has already done. He says to us, beginning in the 52nd chapter, the 13th verse, Behold, my servant will prosper. And this is talking about Jesus. Jesus identified that he was his servant when he made the statement. He said, he that is greatest among you is servant of all. He said, but I came among you as one to serve. This was after he had washed their feet. He let us know he came as a servant. And God giving testimony concerning Jesus and what he would accomplish in the earth, God speaks here in the 52nd chapter and the 13th verse, and he says, Behold, my servant will prosper. And the word prosper there means he will press through to righteousness. He will cleave through to righteousness. He will be successful in preparing a place for us. God prophesies concerning Jesus. He says, he will be high and lifted up. Well, Paul said that in Ephesians 1. He was raised above all gods. God had given him the name above every name, he told us in the book of Philippians. And greatly exalted. Yes, he was greatly exalted. He was successful. He was raised from the dead. And then Isaiah prophesies in the 14th verse, going back to what he would go through in the physical. The 13th verse, he tells us the spiritual. The 14th verse, he puts us back in the physical, what Jesus had to physically go through in this warfare. He says, just as many were astonished at you, my people. So his appearance was marred more than any man. And his form, that means he was bruised all over his body, we know that. We take the communion services and we grind up with our teeth the powder, the wafer. That's what happened to the Lord Jesus. Verse 15 talks about his blood. Thus he will sprinkle many nations. Kings will shut their mouths on account of him. And what had not been told them they will see. And what they had not heard they will understand. And then we come to the 53rd chapter about what Jesus has accomplished for us. Everything in the New Testament is about what Jesus accomplished for us. It all hinges on this 53rd chapter of the book of Isaiah. And God prophesies and tells what's going to happen and he makes a statement. He says, who I want to circle who had put has anybody has believed our message King James Mr. Herod says report First John the Lord says he makes every man's life a lie that does not believe the report God said he makes your life a lie that does not believe that report and so your life is a lie if you're not defeating demon powers your life is a lie if you're not possessing the land. Your life is a lie if the powers of hell have not been broken over your life. You see, you can find this also talked about also in Isaiah. About when our righteous become as filthy rags. And God said, there's no one who stirs up himself to take hold of you. And then it says that God does something. It says, and thou hast delivered them over into the power of of their iniquity. I'm quoting the 64th chapter of Isaiah where I'm coming from. So we know about this 53rd chapter. And let's go back and look at some of the scriptures in the New Testament that points us back to this 53rd chapter. Let's go to Colossians 2 for a moment. Colossians 2. Verse 13 says to us that when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions. You might want to take that verse and put there 
our promised inheritance. Just like Joshua was given an inheritance, the finished works of Calvary is our promised inheritance. What did he do? What was his report? Colossians 2 is a report. Having canceled out the certificate of debt, you might want to put the curses of God's judgment against us. Consisting of decrees against us and which was hostile to us, he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. When he had disarmed the rulers and the authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. Them there are demons. Say with me, God has triumphed. God has triumphed. Through Christ Jesus. Through Christ Jesus. That's the report. Well, the Lord talks about some hindrances to this report. He talks about people that get off on visions they've seen or some dreams they've had. It causes them to lose their inheritance. And he says to us very clearly in verse 16, Therefore let no one act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon, or a Sabbath day. He's saying to us, the rest of these verses can stop you and cause you to lose your inheritance. Let's look at it. You ever had people say, you mean you eat bacon? Did he say in the Old Testament? Yet they forgot what the Lord said that Jesus did. He pronounced all food clean. He told us that we can, we sanctify the food. A word of prayer and thanksgiving. So in the new covenant, God pronounced all foods clean. That's why when they fed me camel in Israel and, and, and rattlesnake in, 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 in communist China, I didn't complain. But I had to be honest about it, I didn't know I was eating until the next day. <laughs> but I still didn't complain about it. <laughs> because I knew that all food was pronounced clean. I remember giving thanks for it. The Bible said it was sanctified by a word of prayer. He's all drink. Or in respect to a festival, Paul wrote about those festivals they kept. You see it happening, we talked about it in destroying Jewish myths. And they told them, and I watched the church, they were trying to celebrate Pentecost because the Jews were celebrating Pentecost. It's festivals, were feasts, or the new moons, or to a Sabbath day. We watch the body fighting about is it a Sabbath, Saturday or is it Sunday? With the, with the believer, every day is a Sabbath day. It was talking about the rest of God, the Sabbath rest. He was saying, if you find yourself involved in that, you can, it can cause you to lose your inheritance. Then he goes on to say, explaining to us what all these things were. Keeping Pentecost, keeping all these days, Keeping all these feasts, eating special foods. He says to us, these were things which were or just a shadow. If you look on this wall behind the camera light, there's my shadow on the curtain. God is saying to us, all these things was like my hand, my shadow on this curtain. It serves, it serves no good whatsoever there is nothing that a shadow does can you think of any good thing about a shadow one God says to us through Paul and telling us about the report things which are a mere shadow of what is to come and he goes back and he points to the substance you see as you look at the shadow on the curtain the substance is the hand and he says to us, the substance belongs to who? Christ. Literally what that says is, the substance is of Christ. 
we talk about becoming partakers of his divine nature. Becoming showers in Christ. And he says to us again, and a warning. What can cause us to lose our inheritance? What can cause us not to possess the land? Let me tell you people something. Did you know we could come up in this church with a list of rules that would take out of you as much energy to keep all those rules and celebrate all these days as it would take out of you to learn to fight the war and to fight it by what God has told us to do. And we can lose the land that God told us to possess. So he warns us again. He says, let no one keep defrauding you. In verse 18. Of your prize. By delighting in. What's that word right there? Self-abasement. So he tell you, well you need to do this. You need to do that. And then everything will be all right. Let me give you an example. Fasting is good. And I've seen people who are not, this is what I'm about to say, walking in obedience. And they've been told by someone, the reason you came from God because you need to be able to fast more. But they never told them, you better be also found keeping his commandments. You better also be found working out your salvation. You better be also found turning away from everything you know that is evil. So they think they can continue to hang on to all these things and just fast. And then therefore it's going to force God to move. That's what Paul's talking about. He said, that can cause you to lose your inheritance. He says, the worship of angels. Folks, we've gone beyond worshiping the angels in charismatic churches today. Mostly every major, known, charismatic preacher, when he prays, he says, I send forth the angels to go and bring me my finances. Yes. Yes. There is no scripture in the word of God that tells us that as those that are following the Lord Jesus Christ, that we have any place in even talking to the angels. The Bible says very clearly in Psalms 103, Bless the Lord, ye his angels, that are mighty in strength, that hearken to the voice of his word. We're never told to talk to angels. He goes on to say very clearly here, taking his stand. Where did he get this foundation? On visions he has seen. Folks, did you catch that? Because he saw some vision. Something in the supernatural happened. He formed a doctrine and began to teach it. And to teach it as if it was equal to the standard of the Old Testament prophets, the New Testament apostles, and Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone on some vision that he had seen. And God says very clearly, this person is inflated, that means proud and puffed up, without cause by his fleshly mind. I talk to men that, that live in their imaginations and they say from their imaginations God told me. And God began to tell us what happened. How he began to lose his inheritance. He says in verse 19 not holding fast. Remember what we learned yesterday about clinging? what it means to abide. Not holding fast to Jesus. That's the head, isn't it? To the head. From whom the entire body, that means every member, if you remember the body of Christ, you better be glued with your eyes on Jesus. Not a piece of flesh, not my flesh or anybody else's flesh. He says his whole body is being supplied and held together by the joints and the ligaments. Bible says it grows with the growth which is from God. Are those words also in your Bible? Amen. What we just got through reading was a warning that will stop us from believing the report. Also in the book of Hebrews, the second chapter. Hebrews, the 
He writes again by your spirit and he says to us. Now, folks, I can't tell if it's hot in here or cold in here, so if you're still getting under the covers, I'm going to tell because I'm under the lights. Okay? In Hebrews chapter 2, notice what it says in verse 14. Hebrews 2, and let's look at verse 14. <clears throat> Hebrews 2, verse 14. He talks again about this report. He says, Since then the children share in the flesh and the blood. He himself, talking about Jesus, likewise also, he says, partook of the same that through death he might render, what does your Bible say there? Powerless. Power. Say it with me. Satan has been rendered powerless. Satan has been rendered powerless. He might render him rendered powerless him who had the power of death. And God goes the extra mile so we can understand it. He even identifies it. Who he said it was. He says it was who? The devil. The devil. The devil. And James says that he destroyed. He destroyed. That through death he might destroy him. King James says that through death he might destroy him. Say with me, Satan has been destroyed. Satan has been destroyed. You see, you won't believe this, folks, if you're holding on to something else. If you're holding on to how strong the devil has been in your life. If you're holding on to how long you've been cursed and condemned under God's judgment. You get your eyes on Jesus. You put your eyes on him. Everything that we're walking in hinges on Isaiah 53. And what Paul is doing here, he's expounding and magnifying the report that God has already given concerning his son. And he goes on to say, and might deliver those. He tells us the purpose of his dying. Those who through fear of death Those who through fear of death were subject to slavery. What slave is that talking about? Because you know, we are supposed to be called slaves. Is that right? That's right. But what slave is this talking about? Slave of sin. Slaves of sin. Those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. Again, pointing to the report, he says in verse 16, For assuredly, he does not give help to angels. Talking about Jesus. But he gives help to who? The descendant of Abraham. Who is the descendant of Abraham? We are. We are. We are. Now, we know that that makes a lot of natural Jews very angry to hear Gentiles in the flesh who have received Jesus as a Messiah say that we are the seed of Abraham. But again, we do this because our faith is in the word of God. And God attest, testifies again through Brother Paul by his word. Galatians 3, verse 29. If we belong to Christ, then we are Abraham's seed. And we are heirs according to promise. Paul goes beyond that in Galatians 6. He says... Neither circumcision means anything. You see, he's pointing back again to Isaiah 53. And to the Jews, circumcision was everything. It was the mark. It was a sign of being one of Abraham's descendants. Because it was Abraham that God first gave the sign to. And Abraham was told to tell every generation that on the eighth day, every male child was to be circumcised. It was a sign. But now Paul says to us in Galatians 6, do the circumcision means anything or uncircumcision but the new creature. And those who will walk by this rule, what rule? The rule of the new creature. Paul tells us who the Israel of God is. He says, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. He calls the body of Christ and those who belong to Christ Jesus as the true Israel of God. So he says here, he gives help to the descendant of Abraham. If you truly belong to Christ, one of the purposes of Isaac 53 is so that you can be, receive help in overcoming. So he goes on to say, therefore, he had been made like his brother in all things, that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, 
to make propitiation. That means he's a, he's a mercy seat, a place of mercy for the sins of the people. And that's what God promised. He told us in, also in Hebrews in two places. It's after those days, he says, I will write my law in their hearts and upon their minds. Then he says something else. He says, I will be merciful to their sins and their iniquities. And the second thing he said was, and their sins and iniquities, I remember no more. Again, Paul is amplifying the report of Isaiah 53, our inheritance, possessing the land, driving the enemy out, knowing that Satan has been destroyed or he has been made powerless. That's the report of Isaiah 53. Knowing that Christ has borne all our sins and all our diseases. That's the report of Isaiah 53. And God talks about holding the hand, looking unto Jesus. Can you say amen to that? Amen. It goes on to say in verse 18, For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to aid of those who are tempted. So we're learning this in these last days. Well, our faith is what prevents us from believing God. In 2 Corinthians, we sort of go there earlier, the 6th chapter, and so again, the 12th verse. Paul tells us very clearly the things that can cause us to lose our inheritance is all the other things in our lives that we love that gives us pleasure and comfort. See, that's the greatest weakness we have with the flesh. To always choose the path that gives us the greatest pleasure and comfort. And Paul says, you're not restrained by us, but you are restrained in your own what? Affections. Are those words also in your Bible? Well, we see very clearly in Psalm 78, we went there, and we looked at this last week, about they limited God. Because they do not believe in his salvation. You know what their faith was in? Their faith was in the man. Was in the flesh. that fell to the earth and they began to eat. Their, flesh, their faith was in their full bellies. Comfort zone. And so we see they lost their salvation. They made their inheritance void. Well... We talked before about remaining enemies of God as long as we don't fight. Remember reading that? We saw also that God destroys the fearful and the unbelieving. We saw that fear stops all obedience. Fear threatens to destroy. Fear disables. Fear chokes. Fear paralyzes. Fear doubts God. Fear distrusts God. Fear disbelieves God. What fear does is begin to trust the enemy. It trusts everything the enemy says. It trusts everything the enemy does. Fear brings and attracts the enemy. Fear calls the enemy. Fear strengthens the enemy. We also saw very clearly, if we fear the enemy, we may be begging against God. If we're afraid, God won't use us. He rejects us. Fear is doubting God. Fear is calling God a liar. Fear is faith in the enemy's word and strength. We saw very clearly last week that God told us to destroy the enemy. There's a much endurance we gain the land. We're told in 1 Corinthians 16, 13, be on the alert. We saw that God gave us weapons. We saw in Isaiah 49 that God will deliver us. Yes, the prey can be taken from the mighty man. I want to show you today, back in the Old Testament, about why the enemy tries to get us to fear. Let's go to the book of Nehemiah. The book of Nehemiah. And let's go into the sixth chapter. Nehemiah chapter six.
and thus see what are the plights of the enemy. The purpose of why the enemy is out to make us fearful. I remind you again that the fearful and the unbelieving spend eternity in hell. Can you say amen to that? Ever hear people say, I'm afraid I'm not going to make it. As long as you're walking in fear, you're not going to make it. Your answer should be say, I have a report. I'm going to make it because I'm going to call on God. I'm going to claim to God. I'm not telling God until he changed me. In Ephesians, the sixth chapter, excuse me, excuse me, Nehemiah, the sixth chapter, this is when the enemy kept sending words to Nehemiah, using influential people to send words to Nehemiah. Nehemiah says in the 12th verse, and I perceive that surely God had not sent him, but he had uttered his prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sambalat had hired him. He was hired for this reason, that I might what? Become frightened, and when you become frightened, notice the actions, and act accordingly, that means you react to fear, what does God call that? Sin. So that they may have an evil report in order that they could reproach me. In other words, when we react in fear, we give the enemy permission to attack us. He said, report, and they could reproach me, which means come against me. The enemy can demand from God, just like Satan demanded, Jesus said, to have Peter to sit him as we. He sees us walking in fear. He tells God we don't believe him. He demands permission to come against us. Also in Numbers. Let's go to Judges. Let's go to Judges. We've spent enough time in Numbers. The 14th chapter we know that they fear the enemy. And they rebelled against God. If you want to look at it, it's in Numbers 14.9, but let's just want to move on to Judges. The seventh chapter. And I want you to I want you to find how God begins to eliminate using people. Judges 7. Look with me, please, at verse 3. Here you're going to find that two-thirds are rejected and being used by God. Two-thirds. Fear conquers two-thirds of these people. God had given a promise to Gideon. We know that his name is also Jerubbabel. Is that right? And that God had promised him. You can find this in the sixth chapter. And he got some people together to go with him, to stand with him. And God looks down and says, too many of them. In the second verse, the Lord said to Gideon, the people who are with you are too many for me to give many into their hands, lest Israel becomes boastful, saying, my own power has delivered me. Now therefore come, proclaim in the hearing of the people, saying, whoever is what? Afraid and trembling, let him return and depart from Mount Gilead. So how many return? 22,000. And how many remain? 10,000. Is that over two-thirds? Yes. He began with 32,000. Now, folks, put that number of people in your mind. You're looking at 32,000. And then you begin to address the Hittite spirit, the spirit of fear and dread. And you watch what happens and 22,000 are rejected. God can't use them. Will not use them. And will not permit them to be partakers in this victory. Look what Job says in the fifth chapter. Job 5. Talk 
talks about putting your trust in God. And when you trust God, Job 5, let's begin at verse 19. He lets us know about what it means to trust God. He says, from six troubles, he will deliver you. Everybody felt like you had all six on you at one time? <laughs> even in seven, in fact, it was even greater than six. He says, evil will not touch you, which means can't destroy you. In famine, he will redeem you from death. And in war, are we talking about possessing a land in war? Yeah. From the power of the sword. That means you begin to fight, you know the enemy's going to start fighting against you, don't you? You know it. And he's saying to you, that sword of the enemy will not destroy you. Mm-hmm. You'll be hidden from the scourge of the tongue, which means all the gospel is coming against you. God has said, I'll see that it also will not cause you to lose the battle. Neither will you be afraid of violence when it comes, which means you might have some violence come against you. But look at the attitude of those that put their faith in God. In verse 22 he says, you will laugh at violence and famine. Think about it. Neither will you be afraid of wild beasts. Are those words also in your Bible? Yes, sir. For you will be in league, means covenant. The word league means covenant. With the stones of the field. Let me ask you a question. Let's look at a picture in our minds of a field. There's all these stones there. Rocks everywhere. And the wild beasts come charging through. What do those stones do? Huh? Well, what do, what, what do those rocks do? No, they stay there. They stand. They don't move. God has said, well, let's come against us. We won't be moved. We'll be just like a stone in the field. We're, we're, we're unmovable. You catch that? Look what he says. And the base of the field would be what? At peace with you. You know what that means? They see you not moving. <laughs> They'll keep on passing you by. Demons only chase those that run from them. Yes. But see, you're facing God. Who he says in verse 24, and you will know that your tent is secure. And you will visit your abode and you will fear no loss. Are those words also in your mind? Verse 27, he said, Know this, we have investigated, and thus it is. Hear it, and you better know for yourself. <laughs> Say it with me. I'm not running from fear. I'm not going to put with fear. Another name for fear is the word doubt. I'm afraid God won't do it for me. I know he said he'll do it, but he seemed like he does it for everybody else. But for me, Let me remind you of it again. Let's go back to the book of Revelation, 21st chapter. There's a list here of evil people that go to hell. And I want you to see what's on that list. Revelation chapter 21, yes. I want to take verse 8. Whenever you look at verse 8, just remember in your mind there's a verse 7. But I want to take verse 8. But for the what? Fearful of the cowardly. And the unbelieving. Is the unbelieving that a doubter? God says very clearly, they're included along with the rest of these, the abominable, murderers, immoral people, sorcerers, idolaters, and liars. Their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Those words in your Bible. You walk in fear and doubt, you're on your way to hell. You give in to fear and doubt, you're on your way to hell. That's what the Bible is teaching us. Amen. How do you overcome fear? You go through the book of Psalms and see what David says about when I'm afraid, what he'll do. 
you get a walk in it. You speak to it. You command it to lead your life. You speak to doubt and unbelief. You begin to <coughs> dwell and meditate in the Word of God. Cling to the Word of God. Ignore everything that you're feeling. Ignore what you're going through. That's what the Bible teaches. It means that's how we possess the land. That's how we keep leaving the report. Well, let's move on to Psalm 56 and look at some of the things that David said to us. In Psalm 56, David says in the third verse, when I am afraid, what does he put his trust? I'll put my trust in thee. How do you put your trust in, me, in God? There's only one way you can put your trust in God. Through the word, that's right. And he says in verse 4, In God whose word I praise. In God I have put my trust. I shall not be afraid. What can mere man do to me? And yes, will they twist your words? Will they talk about you? He says in verse 7, All day long means the day of salvation. They do what? Distort my words. Let me tell you the people something. I used to always try to defend what I've said. I don't want to do that anymore. All their thoughts are against me for evil. We had an incident happen recently. Uh, you know, this brother comes from East Texas and comes down. In fact, he had a lady sitting in his whole back row last night. They were all from East Texas because they heard the tape on the fear of God. And this brother was in a church where there was a lady, lady that preached the gospel after her husband died, and a lot of us came from the ministry of this man before he died. So now his wife is a, calls herself a preacher, preaching the gospel now. So she heard the very same tape that they heard. And when they heard the tape, they said, my God, this is the truth. We want more of it. One man ordered $300 for the tapes. The tapes was even sitting in the Florida. She hears and she says, I just wonder why that victim is so angry and so bitter. You need to call him and minister to him so he can get more love. It's amazing. Two people can hear the same tape, and one will take the words and distort them and twist them and judge you. He said, all their thoughts are already against you for evil. Thoughts already against you for evil. Mm -hmm. I said to him, my brother, if she calls me, I'll accept a phone call. Yes. But I will tell her as, as loving as I possibly can. <laughs> Ma'am, I don't need your counseling. I didn't call you, you call me. If I need your help, God knows I'll call you. I'm going to do what God told me to do. Mm -hmm. You might not like the way I do it. <clears throat> I'm not trying to do it to please you. I'm doing it to please the Lord. Amen. Yeah. It's amazing to me. Yeah. See, I know the scripture. He said, I'm not afraid what can mere man do to me. He said, all day long they distort my words. Their thoughts are against me for evil. They attack me. That means they attack you with their tongues, with their mouths. They lurk. They watch my steps. As they have waited to take my life. Are those words also in your Bible? Yes. In the 11th verse, he says, in God I put my trust. I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? I remember I used to preach as a coward preacher. I'd always wonder, I wonder if people like it. Today I don't care if they like it or not. I'm living to please God. Period. Period. God, amen. It's what God has done in me. I'm not, I'm not living to make people think I love them or don't love them. That's not even important to me. I'm not trying to prove anything to anybody anymore. I do it the way God tells me to do it. And I keep on going. Well, let's go to Psalms 91 and look at verse... What David says there. This is what he says. He who dwells in the shadow of the Most High. See that, again, that's a reflection of Isaiah 53. Will abide in the shadow of the Almighty, and I will say to the Lord, My refuge, that means your hiding place, my fortress, that means your place of protection. My God in whom I trust. Is he trusting his fear? Is he trusting what people say? No, he's trusting God. And he goes on to say very clearly in verse 3, For it is he, of my God, who delivers you from the snare of the trapper and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions. And under his wings you may seek. You may seek refuge. It's there for you. A lot of people don't seek it there. Mm -hmm. They seek it through some personality. They seek it through everything but God. He talks here about God's faithfulness. 
He says, his faithfulness is a shield and bulwark. You will not be afraid of the terror by night. And folks, I'm going to tell you something. The terrors of hell have been vomited out upon the earth is at night. Yes. He said, but when you're facing God, you'll be afraid of him. Or of the arrow that flies by day. The arrow is God's judgment. Destroyers. He says in Jeremiah the 50th chapter, or Jeremiah 51, I can't remember which one, God calls the demon spirits arrows. In the 32nd chapter of Deuteronomy, God calls the demon spirits arrows. He says to his own people, he says, I will use my arrows on you. I will send famine on you, pestilence. That's why I always find these people, they always got need and lack. I know what I'm listening to. Because see, David said this, I've never seen the righteous forsaken. And I've never seen a seed breaking bread. So I've been thinking about that. Because I'll send this on you. He said, but the teeth of beasts I will send upon you. And crawling things. The testable things of the earth. God calls them as arrows. But when you're looking at God, folks, the demons can come in droves and come against you. Your eyes on God. Not afraid of them. He goes on to say, you won't be afraid of the pestles that stalks in darkness. All of the destruction that lays waste at noon. Noon means the time when Jesus is shining the brightest. Let me tell you people something. Jesus is shining brighter to the earth than he's ever shown since he's been on the earth. Amen. At the same time this is happening, there are people whose lives have been destroyed That's right. continuously. Amen. He said, a thousand may fall at your side. That means a thousand of those who claim they all love God. Or ten thousand at your right hand. See, we're not walking in fear. You're walking to please God, folks. He said, but he won't approach you. How do I know that it's people that God is destroying? Because he says in verse 8, you will only look on with your eyes and see the recompense, that means reward, of the inheritance of the wicked. I want to remind you again, in Bible school, God says in Psalms 50, of the people that hear the word of God and they cast it behind their backs. They take it for granted. Whenever God talks about the wicked for us in the New Testament, he's not talking about, yes, we know that people are wicked that's in the beer joints like we were in the beer joints. They're smoking dope like we smoked dope. A shot dope, or snorted dope, whatever we did with it. And God addresses the wicked in the word of God. He's not so concerned with that. He's concerned with the wickedness among his people who know what the word says and they won't obey the word. He said, for you have made the Lord my refuge. I love the way that's put, don't you? All of a sudden, God speaks as one of us, calling him my refuge. It comes your song, your testimony. God's my refuge. Even the most high, the dwelling place. What does God promise? No evil going to befall you, nor will any plague come near your tent, for he will give his angels charge concerning you. i got a question. Who talks to angels from this verse? God. God does. God does. Thank you, to guard you in all your ways. They will bear you up in their hands lest you strike your foot against a stone. What's the stone? He's a stone. And when you strike your foot against a stone, what do you do? You stumble. What does it mean when you stumble over the stone? Disobedient to the word of God. Where is that found? First Peter. First Peter, thank you. Then he goes on to say, you will tread Upon the lion and the cobra. Oh. You know, some people would try to read this in a little one. And they cast creature about the lion dwelling with the lamb, and they say, Well, that must be in the millennium. <laughs> but God is sitting there saying, folks, we're the lambs. The demon power of the lion. We can walk wherever they walk. They can't touch us. The young lion and the serpent will not trample you down. Excuse me. The young lion and the serpent you will trample down. 
you've got a good Bible, it'll tell you that word serpent, there's a word dragon. You will trample down. Folks, who's the lion? Who's the cobra? Who's the young lion? That's the strongest of all demons. Remember we learned about lions. The old lion, his teeth has fallen out, he roars. Because he knows you'll run from him if you're a coward. Is that why? The young lion doesn't make a sound. He just waits in ambush. And the way that the old lion can continue even to be allowed to be among the young lions, he has to do his part. His part is to make noise, to roar. And so the young lions will kill the prey. And they will allow the old lion to have part of the prey if he continues just to make noise, to roar. And God's even the young lions will trample down. Why is it you can do this? Why is it no evil can come near you? He tells you in verse 14, because he has loved me, therefore I will deliver him. Circle love and put trust also. I will set him securely where? On high. Where is that place known for us? On high? Heavenly, Heavenly places. Where is it located? Where, where is it talked about in the New Testament? Ephesians chapter 2. Seen with him in heavenly places. Mm-hmm. Far above all principalities and powers and rulers of darkness. Because he has known my name, that means he's known his character and nature, he will call upon me and I'll answer him. I will be with him in trouble. Are those words also in your Bible? That means distress. <clears throat> God promises, and he's faithful to his promises. Seeing that God has granted us everything pertaining to life and godliness, but by these precious and magnificent promises, we become partakers of his divine nature. Look at the promise. God says, I will rescue him and honor him. <coughs> With long life, I will satisfy him and let him behold my salvation. Isn't that amazing? In Proverbs, the third chapter, say with me, I'm not running from fear. I'm not running from fear. I'm running with Jesus to trample down fear. In Proverbs the third chapter, he says in verse 21, My son, let them not depart from your sight. Please circle them and put promises. Keep sound wisdom and discretion so there'll be life to your soul an adornment to your neck. Can you imagine the word of God becoming life to your soul? Life to your desires? Life to your emotions? Adornment to your neck? A necklace around your neck, the word of God. Then you will walk in your way securely and your foot will not stumble. When you lie down, you won't be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. And again he speaks, he says, do not be afraid of sudden fear, nor of the onslaught of the wicked when it comes. What is God saying to us? Wicked storms will come. In fact, the word onslaught is storm. Say with me, if I'm a believer, believer, it will happen to me. me. Satan will bring to me me enough distress distress to cause fear. fear. You see, God tells us, don't be afraid of that. The storm will come. But here's a person whose trust is in God. And he says in verse 26, for the Lord will be what? Your confidence. You know what it says? At your side? That means you're confident God's with you in it. I've been through some of those. And look what it says. And will keep your foot from being caught. Guess what? You just discovered something. If your foot gets caught, we now recognize that fear is a demon spirit. That's a snare trap you. In Isaiah 12 chapter 
Listen to what the prophet Isaiah says in Isaiah 12. I think I want the second verse. <clears throat> These are some good scriptures are used to learn how to overcome fear. Isaiah writes, Behold, God is my salvation. I will what? Trust and not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and song, and he has become my what? Salvation. salvation. You know, let me tell you something else. Did y'all know that God knows every threat and hears every threat yes. that the enemy speaks to you before your ears even hear it? Yes. He knows all about the threats of the enemy before they even come to us. He knows every plan the enemy has for us. In fact, since you're in the book of Isaiah, go to the 36th chapter. Let me show you a story. This is quite a story if you're fighting fear. See, I'm talking about possessing the land, taking the land that God's given to us. So when you begin to possess this land that God's given to us, we learn two things today. Fear will come. Distress will come. And storms of the wicked will come. Let me help you. Many times that wicked is not just a demon, it's human beings. Paul called them false brethren. That's among you. But you watch this story. It came about in the 14th year of King Hezekiah. Sennacherib. That word Sennacherib means the thorn laid waste. King of Assyria. We talk much about Assyria. It means a place of compromise. You won't go all the way back to the world. You say, well, I'm not going back to Egypt. Can't go back to my drugs. Can't go back to my whoredoms. But I'll just go back to Assyria. Came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and seized them. Please circle fortified cities and put me. I don't mean put Victor, I mean put your name there. And then put there Ephesians 6, enclosed and encased in the full armor of God. You and I today are supposed to be that fortified city. We today, individually, are the fortified cities of God. And the king of Assyria sent Rabsheki from Lachish to Jerusalem to King Hezekiah with a large army. And he stood by the conduit of the upper pool on the highway of the fullest field. Then Elikim, the son of Helkai, who was over the household and sheep of the scribe, and Joab, the son of Asaph, the recorder, came out to him. Then Rabsheki said to them, Say now to Hezekiah, Thus says the great king, the king of Assyria, demon powers, begin to boast, boast and brag, called himself a great king. What is this, what's that word? Confidence. The confidence is, I know God is with me at my side. What is this, you know that God is with you at your side, that you have? I say, the demons speak, your counsel and strength for the war. Wait a minute. I should even show it to you because uh, I ain't going there, but I'm going to show it to you anyway. Your counsel, and please underline, your strength for war. I might as well tell you now, God only gives his strength for war. If you're not fighting and obeying, God does not give you strength for war. He has said to us all the things that we've learned are only empty words. This demon's got a power to brag and boast to us. Everything your God says are empty words. When God tells you, you come back with a whole heart, I'll restore you. You're taking that attitude when you say, I'm afraid 
I'm not going to make it. What you've done, you've listened to Rav Shanker. And you've heard him say that all that you've seen that God said he'll do is empty words, just mere talk, cheap talk. That's been your attitude. When you say, I'm afraid, I'm not going to make it. You're saying, God, that word you gave me, only empty words. And I would rather listen to Rav Shanker. And then he says to her, now on whom do you rely? This, this, this man represents a principality in the power. That you have rebelled against me. Folks, let me ask you a question. If you've been brought to this place, are we rebelling against all this stuff we've been fed? Mm-hmm. Yeah, are we beginning to rebel against these demon spirits? Yes. That's right. The demons are saying to us, what, what made you stop serving me? Yes, that's right. <laughs> this God you're relying on, just not a bunch of empty talk. That's right. Now you go put your trust in. You might as well give up. See, this happened to this man. Behold, you rely on the staff of this crushed reed, even on Egypt, on which if a man reigns, it will go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all who rely on him. That means look at the world. That's a partial truth, isn't it? Yes. See, demons always teach the partial truth. But if you say to me, we trust in the Lord of our God, is it not he whose high place and whose altar Hezekiah has taken away and has said to Judah and to Jerusalem, you shall have worshipped before this altar? Verse 8. Now therefore, come. It's amazing. Jesus says come. The demons say come. Make a bargain with my master. James says pledges. Pledges. Yes. Yeah. The king of Assyria, and I will give you 2,000 horses if you are able on your part to set riders on them. Let me tell you something. That is the absolute truth. The demons are saying if you don't fight, I'll meet your needs. I'll give you comfort. I'll give you peace. And I'll give you pleasure. I'll make you rich if that's what you want. Just don't fight in the war. Watch this. Brother, that pledge is not mean pledge for money. No, I know that's okay. right. I, I understand. I, I, okay. just, I appreciate that. Okay. Verse 9. How then can you repulse? It means put down or turn back one official of the least of my master's servants. Let me tell you something. Let me help you. Pain in verse 9. I cannot turn back one demon at all. And neither can you in our own strength. But the demons are turned back in the strength of God. And God only gives us his strength as we take him at his word and believe his word. And rise up to stand against them. And you rely on Egypt for chariots of a horseman. Listen to this lie, he tells. And have I now come up without the Lord's approval against this land to destroy it? Listen to this other lie. The Lord said to me, Go up against this land and destroy it. Did God tell that man that? No. Let me ask you a question. How many times have you found yourself in a place of, of, of a hellish terror and you said, is God that has happened to me because of my sin? What is my sin? Let me tell you something. When you sin, you know what your sin is. When judgment comes, God tell you the sin it's about. <laughs> oh, what have I done wrong? You sure, you, sure, you sure have a sin somewhere? I know what I did. But all this judges against me. Won't you go up against it then? Then Elikim and Shebna and Jonah said to Rav Speak now to your servants in Aramaic, for we understand it, and do not speak with us in Judean, in the hearing of the people who are on the wall. And Rav said, 
By the way, I don't know if I told you that's what Rapshaka means. I tell y'all. It means chief cupbearer. Chief cupbearer. He's the number one agent that Satan uses. He stands for a strong principality. He gets his orders directly from Satan. So now we see what fear is. It's an order that comes directly from Satan. But Ralph Shanker said, Has my master sent me only to your master and to you to speak these words? And not to the men who sit on the wall doomed to eat their own dung and drink their own urine with you? I want you to notice something. Notice how vulgar the enemy speaks. Mm -hmm. That's right. And some of us would rather believe those words that we're not going to make it. We're not going to have any good food to eat and be reduced to eat our own dung and drink our own urine. Every time you believe fear, that's what you're saying. <clears throat> Are you listening to me? Well, this is quite a story, but I can go a little bit more. And Rapshanka stood and cried with a loud voice in Judean and said, <laughs> What's amazing about this? Notice the demons don't do nothing to tell him to do. They told him, Don't speak to us in Judean. The enemy gets stronger. He cried with a loud voice in Judean and said, Hear the words of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus says the king, Do not let Hezekiah deceive you, for he will not be able to deliver you. Nor let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, The Lord will truly deliver us. This city shall not be given to the hands of the king of Assyria. Do not listen to Hezekiah. Satan is saying continuously, Don't listen to the word. Don't listen to the word. Don't put your trust in the word. Don't believe the word. Believe what you feel. Believe what you hear in your head. Believe what everybody else is saying. Don't listen to the word. And we're saying, okay. When well, it's break time. It's 11.33. We'll begin again.